Okay, let's do so welcome to this episode of Menopause Conversations. My name is Amantha King. I'm a, a strength performance coach and a menopause coach. And I'm delighted to be doing this series. This is the uh, second season of this series. And I've got just the most brilliant guests, one of which is here with me today, Dr. Karis Sonnenberg. Karis, hello, how are you? Hello, I'm very well. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, no, you're really, really welcome. And Karis and I have met each other on Instagram and LinkedIn and we finally got in touch and we had a lovely conversation a little while ago and we thought it would be a really good idea to get Dr. Karis on to talk about a topic that I think will just fascinate so many people, people who are going through the menopause transition, people who are nowhere near it possibly, um, and those supporting people going through the menopause transition, because we're going to talk about the effects of hormones on our brains and I just think this is going to be such a fantastic topic so uh, Dr Karis welcome to uh, this menopause conversation and and to have this topic with me tell us a little bit about yourself I mean you're a GP we know that you know you've got a special interest in menopause and you know you're really fascinated about the brain but I mean were you always interested about this has this been something throughout your whole career or is it something relatively new for you I well thank you yeah I um went through menopause myself about three or four years ago and um, naturally became much more interested um, as I was finding out about my own treatment and then um, I am a women's health specialist so I started to see more and more cases uh, of the menopause at work um, and um, then I fell over injured my knee in February and during that healing process of my uh, my knee ligaments healing and post-operation I started to think right I'm really going to get to grips with this now and um, sort out my protocols for work and then became increasingly fascinated about the effects of the hormones and did a lot more research into it so um, and it's absolutely helping me deal with my women who are progesterone sensitive. I'm much more able to um, pick up on those women that struggle to take contraceptive pill um, through their whole lives. Um, and those women in whom we give HRT and it doesn't suit them. So really getting in to the symptoms that women may suffer from without really realizing what it is that's wrong and not just saying to them, well, okay, well, if you feel that way, we'll try a different pill or we'll try this instead, but really truly understanding why we need to do that. And I think the more you understand the actual menstrual cycle and those people who might not be ovulating and why those symptoms might be happening or what effect progestogens may be having on them, um, it makes practicing as a women's health um, doctor so much easier um, when you really, really truly understand what's going on, what the hormone is actually going to the brain to do, um, how it acts as a hormone, how it affects the neurotransmitters in the brain, um, how it can affect your feelings. So yeah, really, really fascinated. The more you look into something, the more incredible it does it seems. So yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, very enthusiastic about that part. Oh, and you and, for a long time. <laughs> and you so and you so are, which is why um we're gonna put your contact details at the end, but I would honestly um encourage anybody to look up Dr. Karis Sonnenberg on LinkedIn um and Instagram particularly because you are amazing I know you've got Facebook um account as well but um you just make the complex simple and that is no mean feat because there is so much information out there but I love 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 seeing your visuals because you take complex elements and you break them down into really simple manageable bite-sized bits that people can go okay I get that bit give me the next bit you know and <laughs> and knowledge is power isn't it really yes, it, it absolutely. really is and and like you said there when you were sort of dealing with your own you know situation in your own ligaments and and things like that you know it does make you feel like okay now I know why it's important to do x and y um yeah. whereas we don't want our patients to be passive in this process do we so yeah. so one of the things we thought we could do today was um we'll do like a real 101 on hormones and because you're the expert you're going to do an amazing job i know of helping explain okay what are these things called hormones and um, we're going to go back to basics. So this is, you know, if you are a woman or someone who has female hormones, you will identify with everything that Dr. Karras is about to tell you because it's relevant to you in the way that these hormones work. But then we want to then in the midsection of this conversation, take you through well, what happens when 
things go a bit wobbly or a bit awry and how you might end up noticing them. So no pressure, Dr. Harris. And I know you, <laughs> I know you won't feel the pressure because it, honestly, yeah. of all my guests, you're the one who's so absolutely prepared for this. We just had a little chat before we came online. I've just seen Dr. Harris's notes. I mean, I'm already feeling a little intimidated, but she's brilliant. So tell us, you, you start where you want to start. And we did talk about the menstrual cycle. Yes, let's, I think we've got to start at the beginning. Yeah, let's start um, there then. So if we start at the beginning, then we really understand where the hormones are, or where they're placed in our menstrual cycle, we're going to have a normal cycle. So if you start at the beginning of your cycle, your period on day one, you've got your estrogen and your progesterone nice and low. And you've got from your hypothalamus, you've got your gonadotrophin releasing hormone just pulsing nicely down. Um, and it's going to... Um, produce uh, go to your pituitary which is going to cause a release of fsh and that fo- that's called follicle stimulating hormone so that travels down to the um, ovary and stimulates the follicles so you get a few primary follicles that are going to be stimulated and they'll start to produce a little bit of estrogen and that will gradually rise so um, as the estrogen gradually rises it has a negative feedback on on the brain so everything's everything's sort of gently low and then as the estrogen gets to a certain level, it suddenly um, causes, uh, produces a positive feedback, which causes this increase in LH, which is your, um, your stimulating hormone to cause you to ovulate. Um, and then as you ovulate, the egg pops out of one of your little follicles, um, and then that follicle becomes uh, corpus luteum. And that's when you enter, you've ovulated, that's when you enter your your luteal phase of your cycle, which is 14 days before your period would start. And during that time, the the corpus luteum is making more estrogen and it's making progesterone. So you're going to get quite a rise in your progesterone at that time in your cycle, where previously in the first stage of your cycle would be low. So women in whom progesterone is an issue are going to start to see they have their symptoms of progesterone around that time. So the progesterone rises, the estrogen rises, and then if you don't become pregnant, um, then things start to fall again and you get to um, the end of your cycle. Um, You have your period, which then becomes day one. So you need to understand a little bit about how that the, the progesterone is higher at the second part of your cycle and lower in the first part of your cycle. So you can understand those women whom, in whom progesterone causes premenstrual syndrome or um, PMDD, um, they can really struggle with high progesterone. Um, the progesterone is supposed to be your, your happy, feel-good hormone. But in some women, um, progesterone, when we get it into the body, um, we, we could take it in a a progestogen in a, in a type of pill of which there are many synth- synthetic progestogens um, we take it into a body and it's metabolized into something called allopregnanolone and some women um, it's now thought that some women are actually sensitive really just to the progesterone either their own progesterone so progesterone is something that's that you make and something that you can take in the form of utrogestan the rest of the synthetic progestogens are slightly different but but similar-ish. So they're all metabolized into allopregnanolone. That pops up into the brain, goes to your GABA receptors. And in in some women, um, um, it affects the GABA receptors um, in a way in which um, it makes them feel awful, really anxious, um, unwell, um, bloated, you know, it, it, it really affects their mood in the brain, causes them to feel very low. Um, and those women specifically can be very sensitive. About 20% of us are very sensitive to um, progesterone or progestogen. And they think it's because of the allopregnanolone. There are two very, what, the more research you do, the more you realize that lots of people have lots of ideas and um, you think you've understood it. And then someone comes in with a new study that tells you something completely different. And so currently at the moment, that's what, that's what the thought is, which is really interesting because you don't realize that the hormones themselves are hormones so they are sex hormones released from our ovaries they go all around the body they have massive effects on the brain so they can um they can be involved in um in glucose regulation so um they can be involved in um proliferation of nerve cells um they can stop the death of cells um they can be involved in enzyme um, so uh, production that changes free radicals, you know, that, that they can be involved in myel- myelinization, which helps speed up nerve impulses. So there are so many effects that these hormones can actually have upon our brains. And they can also go to the synapse and increase 
um, the amount of neurotransmitters that send messages to different parts of our brains, giving them different um, actions, um, and they can decrease the breakdown of those neurotransmitters. So then they're not just simply hormones, they really do affect the whole part of the brain. So, so you can understand that when you're menopausal, or perimenopausal, even having periods, and you start to think, gosh, I can't remember that. Um, I can't think clearly. I, I feel low and anxious. I feel these things are happening to me. That's what's happening. The hormone levels are changing all the signals in your brain. So that's why things become more difficult for you, right down to the nitty gritty. Um, so I think if people really do understand that, it makes it easier for them to understand the treatment that they're taking and exactly what that's for, rather than just being given a medication and taking it and not truly understanding what's going on. I think it's really important everybody understands what's happening in their body because then it gives them much better insight in how to help themselves. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And and I'm I am one of those people in that when I was in my 20s and 30s, I used to have really bad acne. So, you know, quite estrogen dominant, probably quite and androgen dominant. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was put on a number of things. And um, in the main, most of them I didn't tolerate. I mean, I didn't know that then. I mean, that's why this mm -hmm. conversation is so helpful, because um, people who are premenopausal, so before any of the menopause gets going, this would be helpful because if you know and you suddenly feel not so great in the second half of your cycle or mm -hmm. you've been switched on to something, that's telling you something. That's really helpful information. And um, mm -hmm. and so I used to take something called Dianet, which, which mm -hmm. was for, to help with acne, um, and that was fine. Um, um, some years later I then tried it again and it was totally toxic to me um, and all synthetic progestogens now I can't take I feel so mm -hmm. down my you know there's, it's joyless really is the only way I can describe it I feel totally joyless but the one thing I can take is utrogestan which is the, the progesterone and that that is really good for me. So and, and you're right. And nerve function, it's like piecing all these bits of the puzzle together. Um, mm. And like you say, if you suddenly think, oh, you know, I've got more um, bladder sensitivity, um, you know, an urgency to pee. Who knows? That could be because of, you know, your hormones fluctuating, your your progesterone isn't quite right. It's not protecting your nerves. You know, you, you get very sensitive. It's all of these things. So never to sort of write off a symptom as thinking well it can't possibly be related um mm -hmm. you and I both sort of recommend take you know keeping records using things like the balance app you know take notes because that information is hugely useful if you present yourself in front of a doctor or a menopause specialist um mm. to sort of to, to sort of talk about that so so yeah so it, you're, you're absolutely right you know knowing that menstrual cycle knowing what good looks like for you and just to, to reiterate that pmdd is premenstrual dysphoric disorder and literally yes. i have done um two i'm about to do a second video but i've done a video on my youtube channel and it is it can be really heartbreaking in terms yeah. of the fallout of that you know people do have suicidal ideation people yeah. do feel very very low and very depressed and um, and I suppose that's the thing we must mention as well you know a lot of people present at their doctor possibly maybe the doctor isn't aware menopause trained but have very similar symptoms to depression and anxiety don't they and as mm -hmm. we know terribly high numbers people being put on antidepressants when in fact it's actually yes Hormone. Men menopause, menopause, yeah. menopause. So, um, so let's get. So, shall, shall we get into then talking about? Okay, so let's talk about some of these effects on the brain. Then, um, when we think about okay. those ro roles of hormones, and if we talk about, you know, neurotransmitters. First of all, what is a neurotransmitter? So it's like a signal that comes between one nerve and another. So um, that's how they um, they would communicate with each other. Um, so you have um, we'll talk about four of them today. There okay. are um, there are others, um, but these are the four that I looked at. Um, and so so for example, you've got GABA, which is your um, one of your neurotransmitters, and it's your calming hormone. So it will make you feel less anxious. It will improve your mood. Um, and it's also involved in, in um, motor function and vision. Um, 
So if you have a lot of estrogen, apparently that reduces your GABA. So what that's going to do is increase your glutamate neurotransmitter, which is, which is important for memory and learning. So if you imagine estrogen is going to increase your glutamate, it will help with your verbal recall. It will help you with focus. So those women that find um, brain fog um, difficult at work, um, they find it difficult to concentrate through reading through documents, um, to remember uh, people's names, um, names of drugs, I particularly found really difficult to remember. Okay. Um, that's what was happening there. My estrogen would have been dropping and my glutamate would have been reducing as well, giving me less memory, less learning skills. Um, progesterone um, reduces your glutamate, but it will apparently increase your GABA. Um, so it will calm you. Um, so these, these hormones fluctuating. What I did read, which was really interesting, was that... Um, you need to have the natural flow of hormones for things to work properly. So the estrogen to come and then the progesterone, um, which I thought was really fascinating. So for those people who have an anovulatory cycle, which means that their estrogen never quite makes it high enough to boost that LH surge, which causes the ovulation, um, you're not then going to get your natural flow of estrogen increasing and then your progesterone increasing. So that might also affect your mood. So those women in whom ovulation is difficult, um, maybe polycystic ovarian syndrome, that sort of thing, they're going to have the effects of, of the hormones being at different levels. Mm. Um, so that might well affect their um their brain function as well it, i didn't specifically read about that topic but but it is interesting to think how that could happen it was talking about you know, the natural flow being really important mm. um and you've got the effects of estrogen on dopamine so high estrogen increases your dopamine which is your pleasure hormone your addiction hormone um gives you motivation um now interestingly progesterone has two effects on that so it's what's called a bimodal effect which means okay. that sometimes you have high progesterone would increase dopamine or um low progesterone uh, 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 or high progesterone would decrease dopamine. So um, it can be difficult to understand how these hormones actually do it and why they do both, I don't know. But it is, it's an interesting thing. Serotonin is the same. Progesterone has a bimodal effect on serotonin, which is your well-being and happiness hormone. Um, that certainly helps with your sleep. There's a lot of receptors in your gut. Um, so digestive system regulation. So estrogen will increase your serotonin, which gives you that feeling of happiness and well-being and it helps your sleep, which is why when we're menopausal, the lower estrogen reduces the serotonin, which can affect your brain so you you may not feel quite as happy as you used to um can affect your sleep so um you may be waking at night sweating um and and that's not necessarily to do with this hormone but um to do with the hypothalamus and the temperature control um but you may also have digestive system problems because many of the serotonin receptors are actually in the digestive system maybe 90 percent um, so therefore you may find that everything slows down a bit and you then find that you have quite like IBS type symptoms, mm. you get windy, you may be constipated with diarrhea, with abdominal pain, um, and that all could start to, and, that, and that's the effect of the estrogen, the reducing estrogen on reducing your serotonin. So that can really affect some women, particularly the brain and the gut, which obviously we know love each other. They have this yeah, romance yeah, yeah. together. So, and, I was just, um, and I was just thinking, because actually I saw someone put a post on Instagram today, you know, and I see it quite often about women saying, oh God, I'm just so constipated, yeah. you know, and, and you know, because the estrogen gives that that sort of muscle tonality and that contract, mm -hmm. that, that ability for things to contract well. And if you think, you know, our gut's just one long tube, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and, and if, it's, if it's not able to contract it, in that way um because we lose muscle tone anyway and and that would affect would affect your your gut and your bowel but i think i, th I think it's so interconnected isn't it i mean we know estrogen's got more than three i think it's more than 350 functions in the body yes. so a drop is going to show up in lots yes. of places isn't it and i think what i found quite um interesting what you said there was that um you know certainly with weight you know, it is a complex system, isn't it? You know, what the brain is telling the gut and vice mm -hmm. versa and knowing how GABA actually goes backwards, doesn't it, from your gut up to your brain. So if we're not really looking after ourselves and maybe constantly going for the naughty carbohydrates or the simple sugars, mm -hmm. we never actually feel like we're fully satiated, you know, mm -hmm. because we don't mm -hmm. have enough of that estrogen. So you're constantly going back, going back, going back. And that's also mm -hmm. to 
to give your body more of what it needs it's that isn't it estrone the weaker the weaker mm-hmm. estrogen so it comes it, from your fat cells yeah mm. it comes from your fat cells so it is really really complex but it's knowing chicken egg which bit do we start to deal with so yeah so we've got GABA so far dopamine serotonin is that was there one last one did I miss one? um glutamate yes yeah, so glutamate is going to be your memory one so the yes. estrogen is going to really help you focus and and um that from my understanding that's what um if you have lower estrogen, lower glutamate, that will that will be a problem for your cognitive function, which could be a reason that we have the brain fog um, and the lack of concentration. Because certainly when I was um, having my symptoms of menopause, I found that reading documents was really, really difficult, mm. trying to focus through them um, and trying to remember the names of, of what was there. I would have to make notes upon notes of everything just to try and, uh, and remember things that became really, really difficult. And that's certainly improved taking estrogen in the form of HRT, absolutely. It took a while though, that's one thing I do tell to my patients um, mm. is that it doesn't come back quickly. The cognitive function takes time to, 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 to recover. Um, and what I did read, which was interesting, there was, um, I know now we're discussing with women that actually the benefits of taking HRT are there. If you give it within the first 10 years, particularly for cardiovascular risk, it reduces cardiovascular risk. But what I was also reading is that the brain once you have been deficient in estrogen for over about 10 years in the brain, giving it will not improve things with the cognitive function because the the brain forgets how to use the hormone, Um, which was really, really fascinating. So another reason to make sure that if you have your perimenopausal symptoms, you start to think about what you might like to do because there's there's no right or wrong. It's got to be right for you. But what I really feel so strongly about is that women have to have the information because it would be terribly sad to get to... 10, 20 years down the line and think, I, I just didn't know that. I simply yes. didn't know. And I wasn't able to make an informed decision because no one ever told me that. And um, and I went through the menopause without any symptoms. Um, and, and actually, I wish I'd known that if I had, it, that these are the health benefits to my brain, to my bones, you know, to my, my heart, my cardiovascular system. If I had known that then, would I have made a different choice? So it, whatever choice you make has got to be the right choice for you at the right time. Yeah. There's never any point in regretting anything that's happened. No. But what you have to do is make sure you're really informed of knowing what you're saying no to. Um, and and therefore you you understand things. And then whatever choice you make is the right one. Yeah, absolutely. I Yes, definitely to all of that. And I would also say that... Um, Just to be open minded, there are so many choices available to you in this journey Um, Mm. and you might find that you go along on one form for a while and it's all okay. but be open to the the idea that you might need to switch on to something else, because in a system like even just estrogen that's affected, you know, has 300 different functions you know, as your body ages, as you go through the menopause transition, you know, we do have a lot of challenges thrown at us. Stress can really rock the boat, um, (coughs) you know, and things can suddenly happen that you think, well, why has that happened? And you might need to tweak here, tweak there, but it's not like taking an aspirin, you know, we don't get overnight changes and you just got to be patient um, and Mm. keep talking to your specialist, keep talking to your GP, but, you know, be the architect of your own health really and like you say be informed I mean there there are calls that we should be having a you know a national awareness campaign there should be much much more being done to raise awareness for for not just um women that are about to come into the, the menopause transition but those that are already in it and so maybe one thing that you could either put in a 101 or put in the bin um you know before the women's health um, initiative study, there was there was talk that actually you should only be on on HRT for five years. And someone did actually comment in my Instagram feed saying, huh, "That's that's great. Which five years shall I pick? You know, <laughs> what what can we say to put that to bed now? Obviously, knowing all that we know now, so is that is choice- that still the case that you can only have it for five years? It's not the case that you can only have it for five years. So um, you you can have it for as long as you want to have it. Um, You need to have a discussion each year with your doctor. um, And it really is your choice. There are, um, the the risks we assumed were much higher for breast cancer. And, and And I know that prior to the last 
two or three years even we were saying to women you know you, you um you really have to come off this now this is the time you know you it's, it's too risky for you because we were frightened you know as a doctor you you don't you genuinely would never do anything to harm any of your patients you would always really try and inform them and you would never give them anything that you thought was going to was going to harm them um and so to prescribe hrt to some of my ladies who were in their 70s who were absolutely adamant they were not coming off this stuff just ev I, I would feel so uncomfortable <laughs> about it really really awful um and then um and then i realized you know this is patient choice you, you everybody if you have a terrible terrible symptoms without this medication you've got to accept that there may be some risks and the breast cancer risk may be small we still don't know we're still early days with eutrogestin really aren't we we know that we can take it safely for five years we know increased risk of breast cancer we know that if we give it to somebody under the, under the age of 51 when you naturally would have had your hormones anyway we're, we're safe with no increased risk of breast cancer maybe there's a little well there is a little bit of an increased risk of breast cancer as we get older because we all have that in us anyway um, and maybe a little bit more than that that. but if you have terrible brain function awful symptoms um then maybe you're going to say to yourself well i'm happy to accept that there is a small risk of breast cancer because there is a risk of of, of lots of things you know when i walk out the door there's a risk i could get run over by a bus you know there are risks of things in life and you've got to do you've got to manage your risk so now if you want to you can take it for as long as you want um, um and that's hrt and you certainly can take the vaginal um, estrogen that goes inside the vagina as well for as long as you want those are two separate things but if you're looking at um, women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer or past history of breast cancer you've got to just get the proper advice because obviously the risks are um, are different with those types um, of this yeah of Ab absolutely my daughter's just studying biology and the most interesting fact she said to me last week was she said um, do you know that every week your body actually gets rid of three cancerous cells every week mm -hmm. So we, you know, we a cancerous cell is a cell that's you've got a mutation of some sort. It's a rogue cell, um, but your body will get rid of three every single week um, with, without yeah. any problem. And so that's mm -hmm. the whole point, isn't it? As we get older, the system isn't as robust in doing that. There, we are more likely to have those errors coming through, and then then it becomes a problem. But um, but yeah, I I I intend to take it for as absolutely as long as I possibly can. My mum took it till she was. 70 my mum took it yeah. to seven and she's just amazing you know amazing amazing health um and the only reason she came off it was because her her gp sort of said you know i think she would have quite happily trotted along on it interestingly when she did come off of it started to get fibromyalgic type pain and all of those sorts of things so i do yeah. think we are largely protected and Looking at some of the COVID data, um, we know that um, the largest group of people to be hospitalised are actually men um, mm -hmm. first. The second biggest group were women who weren't on HRT and were over 50. Yeah. But we know that oestrogen does have protective properties. Um, and I suppose the only thing that I do find frustrating at times is that, you know, it's not clear lines of which hormone is doing what. There is mm -hmm. crossover. So that's where it becomes, you know, sometimes we just have to stay on these things for a, a reasonable amount of time, see what's working for us. And then we know if it's that thing that's causing the side effects or if it's the other thing that's causing side effects. But I think yeah. you're right. You made you raise a really good point that, you know, on average, it can take sort of six to 12 months for someone to become stabilized on, on their HRT, whereby they feel, yeah, it's fine. It's all going great guns. So you've got to be in it for the long haul, really, haven't you, to sort of... Yeah, it's not a short thing. And particularly in perimenopause, your FSH level is going up and it's not like a yeah. lovely linear line. It's very, very wiggly. So you might feel great and then you feel terrible and you feel great and terrible. And I hear that all the time. Well, I was on HRT and now it's not working. It's it's not for me. And I'm like, J just let's just see what might be happening. So in those women, not everybody needs a blood test. Not everybody needs those that those sorts of things but a lot of women might need one just to see where they are i find blood tests really quite fascinating because i do think as a patient it's you that I'm, I'm i'm bothered about the blood test is is a little bit of information for me but actually what you're telling me and the symptom relief is much more important yes. to me 
Um, so in some women, we do the blood test um, and, and it's really very low, you know, because women are a bit nervous to start. So when mm. I give them the gel, they might go, I, I've used it, but only one pump don't worry. And I'm like, I, I, I'm worried that you think that you should only take one pump. So I clearly haven't explained it properly because we all absorb gel so differently um, yes. through our, our bodies. And women have such a worry about, is it too much? You know, yes. should I be on two patches of a hundred and I'm not, my estrogen level isn't quite enough. And I said, honestly, that, that, yes, you do. That's what you need. Whereas I've got another lady who had, um, two pumps of the gel and she started testosterone and she's obviously a super absorber. So everything went sky high. So we had to say, I don't think you need testosterone. <laughs> These levels are really super high. So um, we, ev we all absorb things differently. So some mm. of us are gonna need one pump, others will need lots of pumps. And then you might need to reduce the dose as you get, you know, you may have more symptoms, you may, things will change for you. And once you've been through the menopause, it will be a lot more stable. Yeah, um, and, and that's the thing. I think one of the most fascinating things I remembered picking up in, in, in information is we still do have a, a background level of hormones, you know, mm -hmm. you know, your natural own reservoir of hormones. And uh, I sort of explained to my daughter the other day and I said, you know, when you're in your 20s, it's like you've got the Atlantic Ocean in terms of the equivalent of hormones available to you. You know, you get to your 30s and 40s. It's a bit like late, you know, Lake Como in Italy. <laughs> you know, it's a bit like that. And then you get to your 40s, 50s you're sort of talking more like the pond in the back garden if you're lucky and, and then a thimble full yeah. at the end but you've always got something there and you know how when you look at water you know if, if a big gust of wind came across it would cause ripples wouldn't it and and that wind in in our lives can be things like stress it can be things like not sleeping well it can be not looking after yourself not exercising not eating well but these things can all cause ripples in that on that base layer you mm -hmm. then come and add hrt on top Yes, it's the same dose every day. But if you've got this background thing under here doing all of this, it's it's not stable, is it? It's just it's just not it's not stable. Mm -hmm. And I think for so many women, we're sort of sold a bit of a Disney story about HRT, which is it'll sort it will sort everything out for you. And as we've said on so many of these things, you've got to do the you've got to do the other bits of work, haven't you? Like your nutrition, absolutely, your yeah. sleep, and, and and all of those sorts of things. So. So I think they should things. almost come first. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, they, they absolutely. should come first. Because if you don't look at your sugar intake, your weight, your exercise, whether you smoke, whether you're drinking a lot of alcohol, whether your sleep routine is, is difficult, then you, you can't make that better by adding something in. You've got to get those things right and look after mm -hmm. yourself um, and maybe make some changes, you know, with your life with regards to stress levels. So doing some things that might need to maybe change of job, change of hours. I have lots of ladies come in who say, I simply can't do this anymore. Um, and sometimes the right thing to do is not to do it anymore, you know, yes. rather than just medicate them to get through this terrible working environment that some women have um, and men, you know, sometimes the stress levels on people are huge and, and maybe that's the thing to look at as well. It's got to be a holistic approach. I'm certainly very much into what we put into our bodies is really important. Mm. We all eat far too much sugar, which is just really bad for us. And it's in all sorts of different parts of our body. We all eat far too much fruit, um, which is a natural sugar. So we think we're okay. I spoke to one of my patients and, and she was going, don't worry, I'm doing a great job. I just have um, watermelon, that's fine. And I said, oh, how much would you have? And she said, I, I eat the whole thing. So the whole watermelon was one portion for her. So there are lots of, people out there who genuinely don't understand what what they should eat and what they shouldn't eat um, and what a portion is. Um, so yeah, and fruit obviously being a natural form of sugar, but it's still sugar. Um, mm. So it then causes that big sugar high, sugar dip where you get your low mood, massive weight gain because it rushes off to the cells to try and get in. And then if you've got insulin resistance because you're menopausal or perimenopausal, it can't get in there. So it goes to the liver, can't get in there. So it thinks, right, I'm off to the fat cells and it's going to dive in there. You're, you're watermelon in the long run. <laughs> you're wearing your watermelon basically around there, aren't you? <laughs> exactly. Like one of those so, watermelon quite happy in those fat things. cells. It's not coming out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's really so unless we 
unless we really, really are aware and really educated on what we're putting into the body, mm. um, we need to sort that out as well as looking at the hormones. Yeah, absolutely. Because that is a, that's a really big one. I think you know uh, the whole nu- the nutrition side of it and those sort of mic micro metrics but are really actually macro metrics when we think about them because of the impact that they have and um you know i know if i get a bit stressed i'm i'm heading straight for the sugar and my you know my hands on the cupboard before i've even realized and i'm sure i'm not alone in that but the reality no. is my body can't cope with that any any longer and you know even things like the type of exercise i do to try and shed weight has become really important you know mm-hmm. hit workouts don't work for me they make me keep hold of my weight um Mm -hmm. you know walking that's brilliant but things like having protein you know my body's screaming at me to have toast and marmalade and all sorts of things in the morning but I'm having to fight that Mm -hmm. um, and have more protein and stuff so it is this constant re-education isn't it but you're you're right at a time where we haven't got the wherewithal to do it because we're sleep deprived we feel exhausted I haven't got the brain cells Mm -hmm. to do my job let alone do all this other stuff Mm -hmm. Um, but that is really interesting and in my role as a menopause coach I do tend to say to women first of all we'll talk about all of it but let's see where the stress is in your life first of all because actually if HRT is going to work we want it to really work Mm -hmm. so let's get this get the stress sorted out and that's probably a really important message for people to think about here which is that Mm -hmm. you know stress can present in terms of how we function neurologically can't it you know uh, yeah, can't and it's think, quite a few of think. the symptoms of the menopause as yeah. well are stress related. If we read down those things with the anxiety, and yeah. um, so so it's really important. Stress has got such a detrimental um, effect on all parts of the body and how it functions. So it's really important to try, if possible, to reduce that down. But it is difficult when you're, you know, it, particularly when you've got young children. You're trying yeah. to balance your job, your family. You may have money issues. You know, you could have housing issues there are so many parts of the world and, and uh, that give us stress at the moment um, and working out some ways meditation you know just having some time on your own that's all great but if you've got three four toddlers hanging around the house you're not going to be dashing off to find to meditate i don't know where people fit that in but they really or if they do they've got to have a really great support network yes. in order to say look um you know could you please take the children while I go and do this because inevitably you know women as they progress into perimenopause are going to have children of of a young age Mm. now in their 40s some in their 30s some younger than that um so it's trying to have that time to really and not looking on that time as being a luxury because often I'm if I read a book I think oh reading this book you know I've got loads of things I need to do (laughs) and I'm actually just sitting here reading this book but but it isn't a luxury to do that it's a necessity um and I think um it doesn't matter how long you've got but it just should be some time for self-care and it shouldn't be that self-care needs to be at the bottom of the list no that is so important that's lovely that you said that because you're right actually I mean I I became perimenopausal at 36 my daughter was three gosh yeah and I didn't know what hit me, no. quite honestly. Um, but I knew I couldn't go back into mainstream employment. Um, but you're absolutely right. As, as we're getting older, having children later, that you know, the financial mm-hmm. burdens, our parents are going to be older as, mm-hmm. as well and all of that. It is a complex time. And you're absolutely right. And, you know, we've all got the mum guilt gene, haven't we? Which means that we don't, <laughs> we don't put ourselves first. You know, the cat, sit down. <laughs> the cat gets meditation before we get it, you know, or the dog... <laughs> The dog must have his walk, you know, before before we bother to sit down. And when we do then sit down, yeah. you know, and I'm as guilty as this, it's like oh, a glass of wine, please. And yeah. if there's any chocolate coming, that would be lovely too. You know, yeah. it's all these coping been... mechanisms, isn't it? Yeah. Rather than yeah. going, actually, do you know what I need? Just go and run a bath, tip some magnesium salts in there. Yeah. Go and meditate and get an early night. Yeah. And actually, I am becoming more like that. I've, you know, the party girl is going to have to hang up her dancing shoes because I've I've realised I'm so much better yeah. when I give into it. And that's quite hard, isn't it? Because you almost feel like giving in is giving up, but it's not actually. No, it's looking after yourself and realising, you know, the um, it, when it comes to if you have too much to drink, 
that affects your GABA. So your yes. GABA will, will really um, will reduce. And if you haven't got your calming effect, you've got your anxiety. So um, hangover definitely affects neurotransmitters as well. Um, and the alcohol leaves you feeling with low blood sugar and feeling really awful the next day. So yes, it's, it's, um, it's really important the older we get to look after our bodies in every way and have the support to do it sort of so that you you know that it's not something that's that you should count on as being an added extra yeah would it be fair to say that if me seeing the tom cruise film tonight is gonna do wonders for my gaba levels i think it <laughs> it was brilliant i'm definitely gonna watch it again yeah 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 <laughs> it was so good. dr karis and i are both like big tom cruise fans <laughs> I mean, my poor yeah. husband, he's going to just, he's coming along for the ride. But you can imagine, yes. I said, that cinema is going to be full of mums. <laughs> there were a lot of mums. Yeah, yeah. It was really good. Yeah, I, no, I won't I, spoil it for you. But I, I can just say, I think it'd be one of those ones, like the holiday. <laughs> yes. I watch the holiday every Christmas. <laughs> oh, really? Really? <laughs> I love it. So, yeah, it'd be one of those ones that's um, that's sitting there with that for me. Definitely. Really. But it, is, but it is about that, it. isn't it? Because it's very yeah. difficult. The joy does sort of... Z- z- steam out of your life in, or it can do but mm. I think what we, we'd be remiss of us not to say that actually if we do all of these things pay attention to you know how we're looking after ourselves really fully understanding the impact on our brain then the joy does come back into your life you do have more energy this is our second yeah. spring it is a joyous time yeah um for us to to rediscover all sorts of parts about ourselves or or new bits about ourselves so so what would you be what would you say would be the take-home message for people when you know if we were to summarize everything we've talked about today when it comes to effects of the hormones on your brain what should they really be paying attention to um that's a really good question i think what you should be paying attention to is being aware of the cyclical effects of the hormones writing down how you're feeling um not in too detailed a way because then you start to really look at it um differently but writing down how you're feeling each day if you're really struggling and then looking at how that um is changing over the month and could there be something to which you are if you're not taking any medication at all could there be something to which you're sensitive um, if you are taking um, a type of medication, a contraceptive pill, the mini pill, if you've got an implant in, have you got a marina coil? Um, is that how have you felt on that? How has that changed things for you? Um, and um, and then looking at if you're going through perimenopause, just being aware that things will change and it doesn't matter. Don't get too worried about the dose that you're taking. It's how you're feeling while we're getting through that stage. And we can help you try and adjust your dose. So if you're very worried about using too much, but it might be that what you're putting on is just not not going in, not absorbing as well in your skin uh, in comparison to someone else. Um, So um, don't worry if that's happening because this will get better. It will settle. It won't be like this forever. Um, And things will you will come out the other stage of of the at the end of this. Um, And it's if you understand your body and really look at the symptoms that you may be having, um, then you you will know yourself a bit better and understand yourself better. And and then you'll start to realise well, actually, if I do this self-care, if I, like, exactly as you're saying, I need to have an early night, I need to look after myself because I know that makes me feel really good, um, then then you know what things make you feel good. And that's where we want to be in the end, isn't it? We want to be feeling good in ourselves. And it doesn't have to be complicated, expensive, difficult stuff. It's just really simple, simple stuff. So we know our hormones can really affect us in every way. And we know how, how they can help. So we can then make a decision, um, an informed decision of whether we A, want to take hormones or we don't want to take hormones. And if we don't want to take them, then we may understand that we've got to get through this period of time. Um, but, but why we may be feeling away may actually make us feel better because we understand what's going on. Yeah, definitely. I think it, it certainly helped dial down my anxiety about mm. what was going on, you know, because you can feel like your rug is being pulled out from under you. But mm-hmm. getting some really good quality information, and that's probably the last point that I would like to mention. Doctors like mm. Dr. Karis Sonnenberg are putting evidence-based medicine and clinical research they're making that available to you in a format that's easy to understand um, and what I would say is not all 
social media posts are putting accurate information out there and that's something you just need to be careful of isn't it Dr Carries? that yes be careful what sources of information you're using definitely be careful about where you're getting your HRT I mean it should be the body identical yes. HRT uh, regulated HRT um rather than stuff off the internet you know oh gosh uh, definitely yes so you you want the british menopause society don't recommend using the bioidentical hrt to be honest i don't know much about it because it isn't something that i would give no. um it requires a lot of expensive blood testing which um is not necessary um so they recommend we use body identical hrt which is um i think the best thing um and uh, yeah uh, i i agree yeah, definitely. And, and being, being also a little bit aware of some of the menopause sites are set up by people who've had really difficult experiences and just because they have not tolerated something or they found it awful, please don't be put off by that because um, your body is different to other yeah. people. Um, so just definitely. because your friend, your mum didn't tolerate a marina coil, for example, does not mean that you won't absolutely love it. Yeah, exactly. And actually having a specialist as lovely as you, that you can talk to, look at all your options, be open to ideas and suggestions is so important, isn't it? It's like being, yeah. it's, it's that real connection, that partnership with your specialist. So, yes. Yeah. So with, without me forgetting to say that, um, how can people be in touch with you? Um, so either through um, Instagram or my LinkedIn account, and I've got a Facebook account as well um yes and we're going to put all of those in the show notes aren't we so we're going to put that yeah. all available so if you want to be in touch with dr caris um she's absolutely brilliant i think you are and i love seeing <laughs> i love seeing your posts. well you know i do i love seeing your posts um across the socials and they really are they really make sense so if you're an employer watching this it would be worth getting in touch with uh, dr caris you know she's great at speaking about things as you've heard today um but any um employee assistance programs or anything like that they're, they're always looking for amazing doctors doctors you know they don't have to look very far because Dr Karis Sonnenberg is one of them and you're based in Guildford um yes. so thank you so much um thank for you for having me more time oh no, it's been an absolute pleasure I've learned so much from you and we'll make sure those are all covered in the notes but I suppose thank we'll you. say we'll pause the button for now but I know we'll have you back to talk about something else but for now thank you so much Dr Dr Karis Sonnenberg thank you for your time thank you